uh, we start working on this project uh, over the, we have been working on this project over the past five years, and this project started as a collaboration between different groups at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. And uh, we believe that um, we have found um, a new pathway that might regulate cardiac aging and possibly aging of, uh, of, tissue, of different tissues. So aging is a physiologic process. However, uh, the increase in the aging population will have, for sure, a big socioeconomic impact. And just to give you an idea of what we will be facing over the next few decades, the elderly population is growing about 800,000 individuals per month. And it's estimated that by 2030, there will be more than 60 nations that will have at least two million or more or, or people that are aged more than 65. And that what's really important is that at least half of all the people that are over 65, they're experiencing at least one functional or sensory disability. So aging is a, an evolutionary conserved process that is characterized by a progressive decline in uh, tissue and, uh, and cell function. In human, um, uh, uh, aging is uh, characterized by different um, health conditions. What did I do? OK. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, I was trying to use the pointer. Uh, <clears throat> so it's, aging is, is associated with different health conditions, like uh, a decreased cognitive function, immune deficiency. There's a blood vessel disease, bone fragility, muscle atrophy, and uh, cardiac dysfunction. Uh, one thing that is common to all these uh, different conditions is uh, a dysregulation of, uh, of tissue homeostasis and uh, a deficit of, uh, of uh, tissue repair. But one thing that we have to consider is that the, this age-related conditions have likely not been under intense evolutionary pressure. As you can see from this panel, <clears throat> it's interesting to notice that in less than 300 years, uh, life expectancy in France went from a little bit less than 30 years to about 80 in 1740 to about 80 years in 2005. And as you can see, this, this, uh, this, um, this lower points, they represent the wars that were happening, uh, that were happening in Europe. And uh, a very similar scenario could be seen, actually, in the, in the United States, with the exception that you don't see uh, some of the war that were happening in Europe where in a little bit more than 100 years, uh, age life expectancy went from a little bit less than 50 to about 75. And if you're wondering what this negative peak is, this represents the Spanish flu that was happening in, 19, in 1918. So <clears throat> aging itself is characterized by different by systemic changes like, for example, neuromonal dysregulation, and by the presence of a pro-inflammatory state, the so-called uh, inflammaging. And all these changes are believed to uh, contribute to um, cardiac-specific uh, changes. Those include an increase in reactive oxygen species, dysfunctional mitochondria, and there is, of course, cardiac hypertrophy. There is reduced autophagy, there is extracellular matrix dysregulation, and there is also a reduced activity of calcium handling proteins. All these changes <clears throat> that happen specifically uh, at the cardiac level produce and uh, contributes to increase the passive stiffness of the myocardium and uh, to impair the active diastolic re uh, relaxation contributing to deteriorate the diastolic function. So the, this age-related <coughs> uh, structural and functional change have been, that uh, 
uh, together with an increase of, card of cardiomyocyte sites, an increase on, uh, on uh, uh, um, extracellular metric uh, deposition, uh, have been suggested as uh, contributing to the high prevalence of uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction among the, among the, among the aging uh, population. And uh, the importance of heart failure with preserved injection fra ejection fraction is increasing for two main reasons. One is that the population is aging. And also, while for heart failure with, with reduced ejection fraction, there, there are a number of successful therapies nowadays. Uh, there are very few therapies that are effective for to treat uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see from this graph on the left, the number of uh, admission of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is now about 50% of the total admission of patients with heart failure. And as you can see, uh, there's been an increase in the number of patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction over the last few years. And this for two reasons. One is because the population is aging and also because uh, it has improved the uh, diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But one th important thing is to consider is that the survival rate of these two conditions has no difference over time. So it becomes really important to find uh, novel therapies that could actually act and treat uh, at least some components of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So <clears throat> there are um, emerging evi evidence that indicates how uh, circulating factors can actually influence the aging phenotype. And that, that prompted us to formulate the hypothesis that uh, young circulating factors can actually reverse some of the features that are associated with the aging cardiac phenotype. So the concept that blood could actually carry evil humors goes back in time. And for example, in, uh, in ancient Greece, bloodletting, that is the procedure that, that to withdraw blood uh, uh, to treat different diseases, was actually performed extensively, and that was used to treat uh, an enormous number of different diseases. And this kind of practice was actually very common in, uh, in Europe and in the United States until the 19th century when somebody started questioning about the uh, efficacy of the efficiency of this, of this procedure. And if you wonder what's the meaning of this striped pole that it, it can still be seen outside most of the barber shops in the United, especially in the United States, this was a sign that indicated that in that place, bloodletting was, could be performed in particular by those barber surgeons that were actually the people that were, that were performing this, this procedure. And, uh, <clears throat> but also the concept that young blood could carry good stuff is a concept that's also not really, not really new. If you look at this uh, journal that's Philosophical Transactions that started in 1665, there's an article from 1666 where the authors were actually suggesting a trial where they, would, they want to study what would be the effect of transfusing blood from one animal to another. And in particular, they were actually, uh, they were wondering what was gonna happen if uh, blood from a young dog was transfused to an old dog, and if that could actually uh, produce like a change in the behavior of the old dog. Um, there are rumors that some dictators have used young blood. There are even rumors that uh, the dictator in North Korea might have used like blood from, from young kids. But there's this re historical, this, this report, apparently in 1492, Pope Innocent VIII was possibly asked to drink the blood of three young boys to restore his youthful vigor. Um, 
And then, just to go back to our days and a little bit closer to us, there might be someone else that might have like found the secret. Maybe it was a little bit different, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Let's move forward. <laughs> okay, so to test our hypothesis, we use the experimental model of parabiosis where two mice are joined together so they develop a shared circulation. So a cross circulation is established about two, three days after the joining. There is blood chimerism that reaches about 50% by seven to 10 days. There's also rapid exchange of cells and factors uh, across the vascular junction. So because uh, parabiotic pair are connected solely through their common circulation, this model is very powerful to uh, study the effect on, uh, of a circulating factor on, uh, on a tissue function. And just to give you an idea of how powerful parabiosis could be, to approach whether circulating factors can alter tissue function, I will just briefly describe this experiment that was performed by Coleman in the 70s uh, at the Jackson lab. Well, they joined together <clears throat> an obese mouse with a wild type mouse. They also joined together a diabetic mouse with a wild type mouse, and then joined together an OB mouse with a DB mouse. And what they observed is that when an OB mouse was joined with a wild type mouse, the OB mouse would become leaner. When a DB mouse was joined with the wild type, the wild type mouse was eventually dying of starvation. And when an OB mouse and a DB mouse were joined together, the OB mouse was become, would, would be, became leaner. And so what was this experiment suggesting? That the OB gene was coding for a circulating factor that was later identified as leptin, and that uh, the DB did not. Uh, codify for that. Uh, just to give you another <clears throat> quick example, in this study that was uh, performed by Convoy, they were wondering whether uh, exposing, by exposing um, uh, in, uh, the skeletal muscle of an aging mouse to a young circulation, that could actually restore the regenerative capacity of the skeletal muscle. And as you can see from this histological section, uh, in this group of mice that have been joined with a young mouse, uh, <clears throat> the level of regeneration that could be observed after injury was similar to what they were observing in young mice. And it was uh, clearly uh, improved when compared to uh, the level of regeneration of a mouse, of an old mouse that was joined to another old mouse. So in our experiment, <clears throat> we generated uh, heterochronic pairs where uh, a young mouse was surgically joined to an old mouse. And we compared them to isochronic pairs where mice were conjoined at the same, were, were joined at the same, uh, at the same age, both young or both olds, and then also compare with unpaired mice. We used in this case congenic markers, CD45.1 and CD45.2, to verify the establishment of chimerism. Uh, and as you can see from here, four weeks, uh, the mice were sacrificed, and the spleen uh, was analyzed by flow cytometry. And as you can see, there was 50 per, there was uh, development of chimerism. The problem with the CD45.2 mice is that CD45.1 mice are not, um, at, at that age, are not available, so we could not perform the uh, uh, establishment of chimerism on this group of mice, but we we're pretty confident since, uh, you know, because of the experience in the surgical technique that they also develop uh, chimerism. So this study was conducted in a randomized and blinded fashion, however, when we harvest the hearts, it was immediately clear that something was happening in the mice, in the old mice that had been joined to, to, to a young mouse. And this, you can see from this low magnification um, histological section, the hearts of mice that were <clears throat> exposed for four weeks 
to a young situation appear to be noticeably smaller than the hearts from isochronic mice uh, that are mice that have been exposed to, a, to, to, to an old circulation. We also normalize uh, the cardiac mass to the tibia length, uh, a parameter that's independent from body weight, and we confirm our finding. So we next move to the, to the um, to test whether or not this would translate in uh, changes at the cellular level. And so we measured cross-sectional area of cardiomyocyte. And as you can see from this bar graph, um, uh, the cardiomyocyte, the old cardiomyocyte, the where cardiomyocytes that were exposed to a young circulation appeared to be significantly smaller than cardiomyocytes from isochronic old pairs. And, uh, and uh, we did not see any difference in the, in the, in the cardiomyocyte sites between all the different groups of young mice, also indicating that the, the, the aging mouse was actually not changing the cardiomyocyte sites in the, in, the young, uh, in the young mouse. And just to exclude that this could be a gender-specific effect, we repeated the, the, <clears throat> the, um, the experiment using male mice, and we did find, we did find the, same, the same result. One important thing and trivial thing we have to exclude was that this effect was just due to a hemodynamic change that was happening in, uh, in aging mice. So what we did, we designed um, uh, a, a custom-built blood pressure measuring device that could hold simultaneously a parabiotic pair, and we measured blood pressure non-invasively uh, <clears throat> using uh, a, a tail cuff computerized system. And as you can see from these graphs, uh, blood pressure at baseline before surgery in aging mice was significantly smaller than blood pressure uh, that was measured in CD45.2 mice. And there was no difference in, uh, in, um, in blood pressure measured in CD45.1 mice, suggesting that it was unlikely that a change that the blood pressure at the entrance of the study could actually explain the phenotype that we were observing. But also we measure non-invasively non blood pressure over the course of 10 weeks in uh, pair mice. We did not see any uh, decrease, any significant decrease in blood pressure in the old heterochronic mice. We also confirm this data by performing uh, simultaneously, a simultaneously hemodynamic invasive uh, measurement. And as you can see from this bar graph on the right, there is no difference in blood pressure among all these different groups. But if you remember from the previous slide, what we, we have seen a difference in blood pressure in, uh, in uh, CD45.1 and CD45.2 mice. Uh, supposedly, those are congenic mice. The only difference is for the for the CD45.1, the CD45 marker. But uh, so we decided to repeat the entire study using only CD45.2 mice to exclude that the, there was something in the CD45.1 mice that could actually explain what we were seeing. And although we could not uh, obtain um, uh, establishment of chimerism. Again, we were pretty confident that because of the surgical technique, with the, those mice were sharing, uh, were developing a shared circulation. And as you can see, again, we did see that in all cardiomyocytes that were exposed to young circulation, the size was significantly smaller from uh, mice that were actually exposed to an old circulation. But you have to think one thing: those animals that they go through parabiosis. Uh, there, are diff there are a number of changes in their behavior, the way they sleep, the way they move, the way they eat. So one thing that we had to exclude if that was this change in the behavior that was responsible for what we were seeing. So we developed this new technique that we call sham parabiosis, where basically those mice are joined together, but they don't develop uh, a shared circulation. So they share all the 
changes, behavioral changes of the parabiotic mice, but not the exchange of factors. In this case, we used, again, CD45.1 and CD45.2 mice because <clears throat> we had to, we had to uh, exclude that there was development of uh, chimerism. And then, as you can see from, uh, from, uh, from, this, uh, from this graph, um, uh, the whole heterochronic sham mice uh, had a hard way tibia length that was not different from the old isochronic, isochronic uh, sham, sham mice. It was, and was significantly higher than the, that, that the one that was measured in the old heterochronic parabiotic mice. So then the next question was, what, is, what are the factors that are responsible for, for these changes? Can we identify them? So we perform an extensive proteomic and lipidomics analysis, but we did not find uh, any significant difference. So we took advantage of this new uh, technology that was developed by Somologic, where they used the, this nucleic acid aptamers, they call somomers. They can bind specifically <coughs> uh, proteins. And um, in the next step, this complex are released, and uh, and subsequently this um, uh, this um, nucle nucleic acid aptamers ap can be analyzed, but by uh, classic uh, molecular biology techniques. This is a very high throughput screening that can actually analyze now up to uh, eleven hundred uh, component like uh, simultaneously, and we found that that. GDF11, it's growth differentiation factor 11, was actually reduced in the circulation of aging mice when compared to young mice. And this was confirmed by Western blotting. As you can see here, <clears throat> the circulating levels of GDF11 are higher in, uh, in, uh, in young mice. And also what was, what was interesting is that heterochronic parabiosis, when those mice were exposed to a young circulation, uh, this was normalizing uh, the circulating levels of, uh, of GDF11 and was restoring the levels to what we have observed in, uh, in, in young mice. And this was not happening for the old isochronic mice. So GDF11 belongs to the TGF beta superfamily and particularly to the group of the activins or inhibins, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it shares about 90% of homology with myostatin or GDF, GDF8. So GDF11 is also known as bone morphogenetic protein 11 and controls the anterior posterior patterning. It's involved in neurogenesis in the spinal cord and the olfactory bulb. And also, GDF11 regulates kidney development and endocrine pancreas development. And the mature form of GDF11 that exists as a dimer of 25 kildalton can bind type 1 TGF beta superfamily receptor, uh, like ACVR1B, uh, and TGF beta receptor 1, or ALK5, and also ALK7, but predominantly uses. ALK4 and ALK5 for signal transduction. So the next step was to test whether or not GDF11 could have an effect on cardiomyocyte in vitro. So we tested the activity of both GDF11 and uh, myostatin on uh, IPS-derived human cardiomyocytes. And it looks like that both can actually uh, stimulate these cells, activating a classic TGF beta pathway. In particular, we can see uh, SMAT2 and SMAT3 phosphorylation, but also it seems to be interesting that there is, a, <clears throat> uh, there is a, an activation of the FOXO uh, 3A protein that's been, uh, that is considered one of the anti-hypertrophic protein because it can activate the proteasome system, ub ubiquitination proteasome system. And also, we then tested on uh, neonatal cardiomyocytes uh, that were isolated 
uh, from rats, whether or not uh, GDF11 and myostatin could actually prevent the folinephrine-induced uh, cardiac hypertrophy. And what we observe is that with, uh, uh, with GDF11 and 50 nanomolar was able to prevent, to reduce the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, folinephrine-induced um, uh, uh, hypertrophy when compared to control, while myostatin could not do that at the same, at the same dose. So the next step was then to test whether or not by restoring in vivo the GDF11 levels, this could have, we could recapitulate the effect that we had seen with parbiosis. So the first thing that we did was, um, was a PK study, a pharmacokinetic study, to establish what was the route and the dose of GDF11. So GDF11 was delivered, was, um, sub, would, was delivered by IP injection, by daily IP, inje IP injection at the dose of 0 0.1 mg per kg. And uh, 20, <coughs> 24 weeks later, mice were sacrificed. And uh, as you can see here, again, from this low magnification uh, 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 cardiac section, Mice that had old mice that had been supplemented with GDF11 appear to be smaller than uh, old mice that were treated with a control. And uh, uh, this was confirmed by the hard weight TBLN ratio that was significantly smaller in the GDF11 treated uh, mice. And uh, the cross sectional area that was significantly smaller again in the GDF11 uh, treated group. So, what was the source of, what is the source of circulating GDF11? Well, we found that the spleen apparently <clears throat> is the, is the, is the uh, highest expression level of, uh, of uh, GDF11 compared to uh, a, a number of different tissues. And what seems to be interesting, what's, what's interesting is that both the expression level and the protein level in the, in the aging spleen appears to decrease according to what we have seen in the circulation. We have not yet identified what is the cell source uh, that's actually responsible for the production of GDF11. So we're still investigating on this aspect. So we have used, uh, we have used um, the 0.1 mg per kg dose based on our initial PK study. And then we were wondering, well, what's going to happen if we actually increase the dose of GDF11? So we tested. This is a, a short experiment. We injected those mice for this. We just finished doing these experiments. We injected those mice for nine days with different doses of uh, GDF11 from 0.1 to 1 mix per kg. And we also injected those mice with myostatin at 0.1 and 0.5 mix per kg. And we did this experiment uh, both in old mice and in young mice. And as you can see from here, it appears there's a dose dependent effect of GDF11 on, uh, on, um, on uh, cardiac hypertrophy, uh, when on cardiac mass. And uh, <clears throat> this is significant for the for the higher dose, while we don't see any significant difference uh, with myostatin at the two intermediate doses. And the same thing can be, it's less clear, but we, it looks like there's a similar trend that is happening in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in young mice. So we tested in our, <clears throat> in the paper that's been published, we tested whether or not a dose of 0.1 mg per kg of GDF11 could actually prevent the pathologic hypertrophy after uh, transverse aortic constriction. That's a classic model in mouse for development of uh, cardiac hypertrophy. And we did not see any, any difference in our previous study with 0.1. So this time, this is a pilot study that we just finished, and we <clears throat> measured, we increased the dose to 0.2 mix per kg, and it looks like that there is a trend towards uh, a reduced, uh, reduced amount of cardiac hypertrophy in this group. 
Of course, this will uh, require uh, extended experiment and perhaps an increased dose to see if, if we can actually prevent the establishment of pathologic uh, uh, cardiac hypertrophy in this model. One other thing that really it looks like to be interesting, it looks very interesting, that is that we have preliminary data that suggests that GDF11 might play actually a role in humans. So this is the data <clears throat> that's been provided by uh, Dr. Peter Gans from uh, US, U, UCSF, and where they have followed like for eight years, 88 five patients that had a chronic coronary disease. And uh, they measured the levels of circulating GDF11 using the same, using the same approach that we had used with the somologic technology. And <clears throat> they divided in quartiles the levels of GDF11. And as you can see, it looks like that the uh, low levels of GDF11 are associated to an, uh, a, a higher le uh, level of left ventricular hypertrophy. And what was really interesting is that low levels of GDF11 were actually predicting very strongly bad outcomes in this uh, select selected group of patients. So <clears throat> I was, as I was telling you at the beginning, this study started as a collaboration between different groups at the, at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. So we took advantage of that to see whether or not <clears throat> this, the, the restoration of youthful, youthful level of GDF11 could actually have any effect on, uh, on, on, on non-cardiac aging phenotype. This is one day of harvesting at 6 a.m. when we start harvesting all these all this mice and all people are coming. And uh, uh, we tested um, the ability of um, both at, of heterochronic probiosis on restoring the, the, the uh, um, division um, ability of uh, skeletal muscle satellite cells. And, that was previously shown, but <clears throat> we also shown that um, this could actually restore the genomic integrity of those cells. And, uh, and, uh, and also, <clears throat> we tested and we verified that GDF11 treatment could actually recapitulate the same effect seen with the heterochronic probiosis a level of the skeletal muscle. And it was, was interesting it, it, that was that GF11 was actually producing a, a physical improvement that was an increased uh, exercise capacity of aging mice that had been treated with the GDF with GDF11 and at the same time an increase in the grip strength from this group of mice. We also <clears throat> tested that uh, we uh, um, that um, heterochronic parbiosis was actually was actually able to increase the vasculature in the subventricular zone of the brain in the mouse, and this was associated with neurogenesis and when, with with, uh, with uh, an improvement in uh, in uh, cognitive behavior and. Uh, when treating aging mice uh, with GDF11, we could actually see a very similar, similar effect to what we had seen in, uh, in uh, heterochronic mice, and that would translate it in an increased number of blood vessels that was associated with an increased neurogenesis. And then there is <coughs> this paper that was, just, was published just a few, day, few days ago and uh, in this paper, they actually identified this myoglianin as the, the hortolog of uh, myostatin and GDF11 in invertebrates. And in particular, they performed this, this study in Drosophila. And they found out that uh, uh, this protein is actually able to regulate lifespan and muscle function during aging in Drosophila. We have no evidence that GDF11 treatment could actually increase the lifespan of, uh, of, uh, of the animals that were treated because we only did short treatment. So we don't know if this, is, this could translate, this effect translate in, uh, in vertebrates. But as you can see from these two graphs, the overexpression of this protein that acts by 
It is secreted by the skeletal muscle and then reduces um, the, <clears throat> the amount of uh, ribosomal RNA and the size of nuclei. And uh, this was prolonging uh, <clears throat> the lifespan of, uh, of, uh, of those flies and also was increasing their uh, ability to, to, to climb when, and when they were getting older. So this whole story basically is telling us that there is a possibility that aging could be in part an hormonal failure. And we have seen that GDF11 apparently is able to uh, <clears throat> control or like to uh, regulate different pathways. So this is definitely an intriguing possibility because it would be interesting to act on this pathway so that we can reverse at least some of this of these changes so that we can improve the out outcome, eventually the outcome of patient with this uh, health conditions that are associated with, with aging. And in particular, with, uh, with um, the discovery of these new molecular pathways uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, aging biology, it could lead to new treatments of uh, age-related heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We, can, we have now <clears throat> different pathways that we, that we can modulate circulating hormones among them. One of them could be GDF11. We might have like some microRNAs that could actually, some of them have an anti-hypertrophic uh, activity like microRNA. 25 and have like, and you know, and we can like, we can actually, <clears throat> we have different ways or modifying metabolic factors that can reverse some of this uh, aging uh, phenotype. So it's interesting <clears throat> to notice how all the interventions that can increase uh, health span may not necessarily increase the lifespan. But then the question is, uh, what is the line that you would choose? Which one do you, do you prefer? And also, the optimal lifespan, it seems to be a matter of perspective. If you look at this, <clears throat> if you interview uh, US adults, 14%, uh, uh, they would say that they would be okay living 78 or under. If you interview young adults that are 18, 29, 19%, they would say that 78 is fine. If you go to people that are 65 or older, there are only 6% that say that, you know, 75 is okay, 78 is okay. So we have done <clears throat> some work on this project. Of course, there are a lot of open questions. Like one thing that is still uh, under investigation is whether or not GDF11 could actually improve, uh, in our case, uh, diastolic function. That's the ultimate goal of, our, of this therapy. We're working on this. We're working on different models, like uh, we're using rats. We're using uh, models of diastolic dysfunction and, uh, be, and test whether or not GDF11 could actually be used for, for, this, for this kind of treatment. And, uh, with this, <clears throat> I would really like to thank uh, the people from my lab, in particular, Dr. Richard Lee, that's been uh, that's my mentor, and then Matt, Jim, and Tommaso, with whom I've been working closely together, and uh, Peter Gans from UCSF, um, Rob Gersten and Nick from the Broad Institute, they performed the uh, the proteomic and metabolomic uh, analysis. And then Brita Singer and Alex Stewart from Somologic for performing the analysis on, uh, on uh, our samples. And of course, <coughs> Amy Wagers, together with Manisha, Jennifer, and Christine uh, from the Jocelyn, and then uh, Lee Rubin and Lida from the, from the uh, Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Thank you very much, and I would take any questions.